today, so popular. <laughs> Such a popular comment. Um, thank you, those of you who gave up your seats, um, for people who needed to sit, and um, I hope you'll be okay standing back there. Um, I did have to turn people away at the door because of the um, fire marshal and rules about capacity. So um, Peg has agreed to um, schedule this program again sometime next year. So you know, anybody you know who didn't get to come this time, um, if you want to come back, <laughs> there'll be another opportunity. Um, we have some historians up here if you want to um, Look at those, take them home, they're free. We also have applications for membership and for gift memberships. It's Christmas. So, if there's anybody on your list who you think would enjoy having a gift membership to the society, that really helps us to um, do the work that we're doing. Um, one of the things that we've been doing recently is filming these programs. So, the other um, opportunity to um, enjoy the program is on our webpage. Um, Peg Wheeler is here today to talk about the first uh, lighthouse keeper on the West Coast. Thank you so much, Peg. Thank you, Joanne. I'd also like to thank the Humboldt Historical Society for inviting me to give this talk. I really appreciate the chance to give to tell Sarah's story. And also to the library. This is just an elegant facility. It sounds like it could use a little bit more space sometimes. <laughs> 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 okay. You heard me thank the Humboldt Historical Society, and you heard me thank the library. I'd also like to thank my friend Julie for this her duds, her life housekeeper lady. <laughs> I love stories. I love all stories but especially strong woman stories. Not just the heroic women, but ordinary women. Those who deal with the challenges of their lives. The unsung heroes. Those who just do what has to be done. These stories are incredibly inspiring to me. And I think that's probably the main sto purpose in stories anyway, to show us what we can be and how we can be. So I became a school librarian for 12 <laughs> years, and there were lots of stories there. <laughs> and then after that, I uh, went back to school myself and to earn a teaching credential. And I began to teach high school English for another 12 years. <laughs> I had learned to love research. And with the coming of computers, oh my goodness, we had, well, a wild, wide web, a whole wide web of world information right at our fingertips. After retirement and uh, some awesome traveling, we had time for family genealogy, and we attended talks on humble history. Eventually, I decided to volunteer as a docent upstairs in the Humboldt room. And there are great resources there for Humboldt and California research. Shortly after that, I decided to volunteer at the Myrtle Grove Cemetery. I liked being outside. It was a thrill for me to uncover a stone that had been <coughs> overgrown by sod. I was compelled to try to find out something about that person. Lots of research and lots of stories there. And that's where I learned about Sarah Johnson. So forgive me this uh, shameless plug, but Myrtle Grove Cemetery is uh, your pioneer cemetery. Many of Humboldt's pioneers are there. Beyond that, it's an important urban open space for Eureka. And in 2015, a woman by the name of Kirby Bradshaw Nunn, who showed up here a minute ago, but they had to send her away because she was full. She's been working to restore the cemetery and with, quite a, with a several volunteers, and they are making great progress. As some of you might notice as you drive by, there are so many more of the monuments standing now than it used to be. So on May, in May of 2016, there was a Memorial Day observance, and two Coast Guard men visited this grave 
and they left this sweet little lantern. Got the gray. Isn't that sweet? And I thought it was ironic. It's a solar lantern. <laughs> and it actually had a light sometime. But that Sarah would have appreciated that, or maybe not. <laughs> they told us Sarah Johnson had been a lighthouse keeper. Man, I was really intrigued. A strong woman story. Uh, reading the stone, it says, In memory of Sarah E. Johnson, a native of Belfast, Ireland. Wow, I have Irish heritage. I'm doubly intrigued. She died on October 19, 1869. That was pretty early in Humboldt's history. So. And she was only 43 years old, so young, and there is, so there's surely a story here. <coughs> so the next time I had a uh, minute when I was up in the Humboldt room, I went to my number one go-to choice for Pioneer Bios, this handsome volume. Early members of the Humboldt County, California Pioneer Society, and it's a whole directory of families that came um, in, in, well, before, I'm not sure of the dates, actually. Early days. Early days, thank you. This is, this is my sentence finisher. That's right, 1850. Yeah, also known as Esther the Prime. So is anybody here from the Pioneer Society? Quite a few, yes. This is still a very active society, a very organization. And it was begun in 1857? 1876, I can't read it. Founded in 1876. 1876, thank you. And we'll go to the index. Thank goodness for indices. Uh, scroll down in the Johnson, then we find Johnson, Sarah E., page 381. Here's page 381, but whoa, this is a page for a James McKenna. So what does that mean? I began to search on down through the, scan through the uh, material there, and clear down at the bottom. Oh, what am I doing? Sorry. <laughs> you have to go back. There you go. Aha. McKenna James. And there's a footnote. On August, it says, in August 1852, Sarah filed for divorce from William McKenna. <coughs> now, that was intriguing because... Divorce didn't happen a lot in those days, but or maybe it did. But um, so that explains it. She had another married name. And then it says Sarah moved up to Eureka in Humboldt County and ended working as a lighthouse keeper to support herself and the children. So we have the right Sarah. So I look at the page next to it, the adjacent page at 382, and I find <coughs> James's older brother, William. And those of you who can read it know that, that he is had the same parents as James, and he was born, William was born in 1843 in New South Wales, Australia. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> she went from Ireland to Australia in those days? I was, my eyes were busy. Mm -hmm. uh, he arrived in California in August of 1849. I remember that date, August 1849. And his arrival in Humboldt was in January of 1853. So, why did they emigrate from Australia? So the first thing that comes to my mind, maybe yours too, the potato famine. From Australia. Mm -hmm. What did I say? <coughs> from Australia. From Australia. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> potato famine. Uh, and then I realized I didn't know exactly when the potato famine occurred, so that gave me another thing to look up. And we discovered that the potato famine was from 1845 to 1855, so that was a little bit too late. 
Um, the next thing I was wondering, could it have been, what comes to my mind anyway, are convicts? And Oh, a number of, uh, between 1788 and 1855, 40,000 Irish convicts were sent to Australia. And in eight, but, so I don't think that could have been it, even, even though convicts People are, the crimes are something as, sim, as minor as a loaf, stealing a loaf of bread. Um, somehow, it didn't seem to fit, but I, I just didn't want it to, I suppose. <laughs> I also learned that uh, in 1840, there was an assisted immigrants program. And um, they granted land to immigrants of people who had skills. This is a flyer that would have been seen on the streets of Belfast in those days, encouraging people to um, emigrate to New South Wales, especially Sydney. Married persons, not exceeding 35 years, could get passage for at five pounds each, and female domestic servants could get it for two pounds each. There was a great need, and, and uh, they would have high wages, which had to be tempting for some people. We know that they made it. We, uh, we know that the col they were trying to populate the colony, and whatever their motive of their immigration, populate it, they did. These are two... Um, <coughs> Baptism certificates. <coughs> the first one is for William, born in 1843, whom we've, ever, we've already spoken about. The other one is for Alexander, a uh, younger brother, born in 1847. They were both Catholic. Sarah's maiden name was Holmes on one of them and Holmes on the other one. But in 1847, they were residing in Balmain, which is just outside Sydney. So we have them placed in a location, and we're starting to get a picture of what their life was turning into. However, they failed to mention for some reason, there, between the two of them, there was born a daughter. Elizabeth was born in 1845. And there's my little token pink picture for a daughter. <laughs> So I'm still gathering puzzle pieces, and I just did a straight-on Google search, which yielded uh, this little architectural journal. I just Googled for William McKenna, 1843, Balmain, and uh, there's a minor little reference in this that gives us some information. Uh, it, was, it says, sold lot 11 to William McKenna, a Balmain carpenter and ship joiner in, in December of 1843. So that supports possibly the Commonwealth's assistance of people with skills, the skill to be that of a carpenter and ship joiner, which would certainly be useful in those days. They don't, they next appear in California in August of 1849. And we wonder why and how, and I think the image gives a little bit of a clue what they're doing in 1849. Uh, word of gold fever had first reached Sydney in December of 1848, when by May, 1849, Sarah, William, and their three children embarked on a sea voyage to California. So there I was one day in the Humboldt room, standing there staring at the shelves of 979.4, and this book jumped out. Gold Fleet for California. 
subtitled 49ers from Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> and there was this amazing table at the back that had, was just chock full of information. Uh, you will remember that they arrived in August of 1849, and this chart actually lists all of the uh, boats that sailed from Sydney to San Francisco and their arrival dates. And we're looking for August 1849. And fortunately, there were only four ships that fit that category, so I would only have four ships to search through passenger lists. Uh, the Fanny, the Spencer, the Louisa, and the Regia. There's a lot of other information about these ships too, but I had this went to this website called shipslist.com, and here's another break I got. They heard on telling you how to use their site, they had this example page. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. William McKenna and three children. Too easy almost. But anyway, there are also eleven couples. Eight children, 47 single men, some of rather dubious personalities. And it doesn't list crew, I don't think. It's possible that it didn't mention crew. Referring back to the Bateson table, it tells us that the Bark Louisa was 307 tons, and this is the basis on which maritime law would determine the number of passengers they were allowed to take. And it was one passenger for every three tons. So doing the math, 78 passengers were aboard. It was well within the limits. I don't know how, the, again, how the crew fit into this, but it must have been okay. They sailed from Sydney, New South Wales, May 26, 1849, and they arrived in San Francisco, August 29, 1849. It's 95 days, see. <laughs> 35 days longer than they had planned for. So I hope they had plenty of provisions, and I wonder how it was with three children under six years. There. So we know they're in San Francisco in August of 1849, and then we next learn that just a couple of months later they're in Benicia in Solano County, which is just up the Delta towards Sacramento. Here's a nice little uh, image I found dated 1850 of Benicia Martinez and Mount Diablo. Kind of sweet. You can see it's starting to grow. October 1849, the reason we know that they are there is there is a son born, James McKenna. She was pregnant that whole voyage. Oh. <laughs> Strong woman, doing what had to be done. Three years later, there was a uh, California census in October, 1852, and William is living at Benicia in Solano County with Sarah and four children, and his occupation is still carpenter. Now, strange to tell, a month before Sarah files for divorce. Birth <laughs> control. Um, just you wait. <laughs> so this penmanship is quite lovely, but it's a little difficult to read. So I've trans. Right, this and I'll read, read, just read a few um, excerpts here. For that said plaintiff on or about the month of May A.D. 1839 was united to the said defendant, William McKinney, 
in the holy bonds of matrimony. So this gives us a marriage date, which is something useful when you're being, trying to understand uh, people's lives, lines, and histories. The plaintiff charges that the said defendant is now and has been for the last three years an habitual drunkard or guilty of habitual intemperance and that during said period he has treated the said plaintiff with extreme cruelty by beating, striking, and choking plaintiff in a cruel and unhuman manner, that this treatment has been such oftentimes to drive her and her children from the house to seek shelter at the mercy of friends. And that for the last three years or more, she has supported and maintained the children by her own industry and exertions. She also requests the property and dwelling which was purchased with money earned by the plaintiff. And I think um, we can assume that it was granted, and it couldn't have been easy, she was, a, she was Catholic, but was one of those situations that were not tolerable. Um, we, think that we think it must have been granted because she next appears in 1853 of January, just a few months later, uh, they arrive in Eureka, as noted in the Pioneer Directory. In June of 1854, a year and a half after arriving in, Hum in Eureka. And William didn't come with her. He shows up in the censuses in Sonora for quite a few years after this. So I think, I think she came here alone with her children. I don't know that act for sure, but I'm assuming that. Um, and anyway, in 1854, there was an unusual birth record this occurs, uh, this is listed in births in Humboldt County as compiled by Marilyn Milaga, and this is another unsung hero. She has, for years, tirelessly worked up directories of births and deaths and marriages from the county record. It's been a very useful tool for researchers. <coughs> McKenna, this is the best birth announcement. William and blank. Thomas E., born 10 June 1854 in Eureka. Now, I don't know why the mother's name is not there. I do know that Thomas continued to live with Sarah through the next several decades. So let it, I will make it of it, it what you will. Oh, they may have reconciled. Alcoholics and Irish people, and not to stereotype, can be very charming. <laughs> we don't know. Okay, in August of 1856, this is from the Susie Baker Fountain paper. There's another unsung hero. Um, many of you know Susie Baker Fountain's work. I think unsung person there is the person who indexed all three of I had to look up her name, it was Ruth Brink, and she took her three years, but it was an incredible resource. August 31st, 1856, she married at the house of William Roberts in Bucksport, W. John Johnson, 43, to Mrs. Sarah McKenna. <laughs> Captain Johnson was the first keeper of the recently built Humboldt Lighthouse. <coughs> then, um, just a few months after that, there was this little there was this little article in the um, Humboldt Times. Captain Johnson, keeper of the lighthouse, while beating down a strong southeaster, went off Bucksport, capsized his small boat, and was sometime in the water, hanging to the boat before he was taken off. 
There was a lad also with him, who, being much lighter, kept above the water better than the captain. <laughs> and of course, this had to have been one of Sarah's sons. <coughs> this suggests, one, that the boy was probably one of Sarah's sons, as I said, and that they were possibly, and pro even probably, at residence in the lighthouse, even without a light. And it also shows the perils of boating across the bay and to get supplies and such. Eighteen fifty-seven, December twentieth. The lens finally comes. Yay! <laughs> the beautiful French, French design Fresnel lens had a central bullseye at, with prisms above and below, and it gave fixed, steady light. From fifty-three feet above the sea, it was visible on a clear night from thirteen miles out. Operative word: clear night. <laughs> when whale oil became scarce, vegetable oil, that is wild cabbage seed, was used. Mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> this uh, le uh, lens is, on the, is housed over at the Humboldt Bay Maritime Museum, over near the Samoa Cook House, mm -hmm. and they're open, and it's a really charming little um, museum to visit. I encourage you to do that. So, what was life like on the lighthouse? First thing I had to do was get my head around the fact that it was on the north strip. Ever since we lived in Humboldt, we only knew about the Table Bluff lighthouse. And there's a detail on the 1865 Doolittle map in your handout. And you can see lighthouse, and just across the bay, you can see Bucksport with Fort Humboldt in the northeast, and then you see Eureka farther up on, at the northeast. We'll refer again to this map shortly. Life on the North Spit in those days was difficult and sometimes dangerous. The station stood in, in isolation amid shifting sand dunes. Although Eureka and Bucksport were within view, getting there during the 1850s and 1860s meant hiking through sand and then wading out to a moored sailboat, weather and tide permitting. I think they had to use a bit rowboat more than a sailboat. Um, making an often sloppy trip across the estuary to the city. This is taken from a book called Shanks that I see a couple of people brought. a nice uh, coverage of our humble lighthouse situation. Um, okay, so that image struck us, and we wanted to find along a little bit more about it, and it was uh, credited to the Bancroft Library, and so we started playing with it. It was an old stereoscope card. And can you see up at the very tip up there? That's quite a long boardwalk. And I, it's not dated, so I don't know if this was, I have a hunch it was after the time Sarah was there, but it <coughs> could be. It's a, un, impossible to tell. You know, my husband played with the images a lot, he likes to do that, and we came, with this, we came up with this one where it's a little bit more distinct. Remember, they were charged with maintaining all the facilities, keeping the light lit, getting supplies, and raising a family. The lighthouse chores and duties. This is a document from 1835, so I think it's probably more relevant for the East Coast, mm -hmm. but still, um, perhaps they use the same kind of <coughs> lists of, problem, of uh, chores. This document directs the wicks to be trimmed every four hours, but other sources have said it must be done hourly. Either way, it's an all-night job. I think it's a good thing that there were two adults there. The other, thing I, the other thing I can't figure out, I've had, I've lived with kerosene lamps, and I don't know how you would 
trim the wick while the, while the light's still on. I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> okay, then we have this notice in the Humble Times, September 28th. Births at the Lighthouse, September 28th, wife of Captain John Johnson, a daughter. They named her Sarah Elizabeth. However, just two, two weeks later, there was another notice in the Humble Times. I'm going to die. Oh. Captain John Johnson keeper of the lighthouse at the entrance to this bay, aged 44 years, native of Maine. Sarah becomes a widow with a two-week-old two infant. Here are some pay records for lighthouse keepers. The source is the National Archives of Records and Administration. <coughs> Name of the light station, Humboldt Beacon and Fog Bell. Name of keeper and assistants, J. Johnson, keeper, annual salary, $1,000. Sarah Johnson, assistant, annual salary, $650. I think that might have been a substantial amount at the time. I don't know. <laughs> February 23rd, 1859. This is nearly two years after the death of her husband. Sarah Johnson is appointed keeper at a salary of $1,000. September that same year, salary was reduced to $600. Now, I don't know, were they just late, just tardy in their record keeping? Um, or did she maybe not tell him for a while. I know that communication was complicated in those days. In 1863 was when she resigned. This is part of the record and the, and the archive. G. H. Nye was a Appointed December 31st, 1863, at a salary of $1,000. Okay, shortly after her husband died, Sarah began to buy property around Humboldt. This little map um, is from the Roberts edition in Buckport. It was a um, flat map that he was proposing to sell property from. And you rec might recognize Tues Truesdale Street, and that X marks about where Seamus T. Bones Restaurant is right now. Okay, the first lot Sarah bought was right there, the red one, um, lot six. And then uh, on your um, map you might see she also bought a quarter section on Table Bluff from Jonathan Clark for $475 in December of 1858. Table Bluff, Table Bluff was a really happening place in those days. On the 15th of March, she buys lots 5, 7, and 8 in Bucksport from Joshua Van Sant for $40. Oh, okay. Why is it no longer the same anymore? Well, because it was abandoned. Okay, it became abandoned. You see that on your um, map. And it fell through, essentially. It never took off. Um, this is the census for July, or for 1860, and this is in the Eel River Township, down near Wilberton Gulch. 
And the people enumerated here is William, down here in the, on the blue line. He was 17 at this time. This is her oldest son, remember. And he was working as a farm laborer at the Robert Meese Stock Ranch. And Eliza, who was 14, was living with a nearby farming family, and the attending school box was checked. So she was going to school, and we don't know if they were living with these people permanently. I suspect that William would have been on his own by now at 17. Uh, I am surprised that uh, her daughter was not kept at home. Certainly she could have used the help, so I give her some credit for letting her daughter go there. However, in October, three months later, Eliza is married to Joshua Van Sant. This is the same census, but on the Bucksport town Township, where the lighthouse is located, and it gives us a little insight to what else was going on in the North Spit during the time. And Enumerated here is Sarah Johnson, 35, a widow, lighthouse keeper, born in Ireland, Alex McKenna, who is 13 by now, and James McKenna, 11, Thomas McKenna, 6, and Sarah Johnson, 2. The next household enumerated, there are two ship carpenters, George and Nathan Fay, and a 20-year-old Irish girl, Ellen Fay. I'm pretty sure she was married to one of the brothers, and these are the Faye brothers that ran a log um, mill out there, and a shingle um, mill, and I think that's what Faye Slough is named after as well. And at the end of the page, it mentions a waterman and a lighterman. So I'm wondering, did Sarah get some help? that lived nearby, a waterman and a lighterman, kind of, what else would they be for? Anyway. Lastly, there's two Indian girls, age 17 and 20, living with two white males. And that kind of <coughs> triggered in my mind something else about 1860. That was the year of the Indian massacres. This is a map that uh, Jerry Brody Included in his article, Genocide and Extortion, in 2010. And it marks the places where there were massacres on the night of February 26th. So that would have been about five months before the census was taken. Um, there were 11 attacks total. But, but that on the first night, there was not just the one at Indian Island. There were two on the South Spit as well as one over in Bucksport. And I can't help but wonder if Sarah heard something. Maybe the surf was too high. Who knows, but it's, she, how, much, how aware was she of that and uh, what was going on? Life goes on. Another birth at the lighthouse. Not Sarah, this time. 19th November, 1861, Eliza and Joshua Van Sand give birth to a son, also named Joshua. It was not uncommon for daughters to have their children at their mother's homes in those days. Here's a, some quick biographical facts about Joshua Van Sand, because he has become part of the family, and he <coughs> figures prominently in Sarah's life. He was born in Maryland. His father, who was also a Joshua, had been mayor of Baltimore. He sailed to Humboldt in 1852 on the Seagull, which wrecked on the Humboldt Bar. And in his obituary, there's a story that he had rescued his shipwrecked future wife, carrying her through the surf when she was but a young girl. I think she rescued him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He also worked for Hans Booner for a while. In 1860, he married Eliza McKenna when she was 15. <coughs> they had six children, five of whom reached adulthood. And in 1873, he was elected Eureka Constable. Okay, visiting your map again. 
We attended one of Jerry Rohde's history talks at Redwood Genealogy Society a while back, and he was extolling the virtues of old maps. And I was deep into Sarah researching, so I looked for a suitable map near to her time at the lighthouse, and it's the map on your handout. And the map over there by the door is the original map, and this is just a small detail of it that someone else has kindly colored and made it a little more interesting. Um, the first thing I saw was the Bucksport, and it, parenthetically beneath it, it said deserted. So I had to ask Jerry what that was about. And he said that about that time, Bucksport had lost its bid for the county seat to Eureka. <coughs> now, the town of Bucksport just never took off, despite, despite Robert's flat map and fine plans. But look over at the very tip of the North Spit, just above the word lighthouse. You should see Indian Reserve. Um, Indian prisoners who had been who were being held at Fort Humboldt in the stockade in crowded and harsh conditions were failing, were falling ill and beginning to die. <laughs> A solution was devised to send them all across the bay to the south end of the North Spit, where it was already federal land. So in late summer of 1862, Sarah and her children lived amid a prisoner of war camp. There was an article in the Humboldt Times written by this man, Austin Wiley, who was the editor at the time, called Our Indian Prisoners. We paid a visit to the Indian quarters on the peninsula near the entrance to a person who has never seen a band of 700 or 800 wild Indians of all ages together. It is a sight truly novel. A line of centuries, centuries stretches from the bay to the beach above the camp, and above which no Indians are allowed to pass. They are thus left at liberty to range over all of the lower end of the peninsula. Here there is an abundance of wood and lumber drifted from the beach, out of which they have managed to build very comfortable huts. <laughs> really interesting article, but I'm not reading all of it. You'll have to look it up sometime. It's fascinating. Uh, supplies were sent over every 10 days. They are fed on beef, hard bread, and flour. After about three months, uh, they were loaded on a boat. I can't picture it, loading 700 to 800 people on a boat. And they were shipped up to Smith River, where they, I think, were housed again in a uh, facility that would have been prepared for them. In 1864, Austin Wiley was appointed by President Lincoln as Superintendent of Indian Affairs for California. Another historically significant event that uh, we can document was the sinking of the steam tug Merrimack on February 22nd of 1863. Captain Booner's dependable tugboat, the Mary Ann, was out of commission. And not knowing when or if it would be repaired, a replacement tug was ordered from San Francisco, the Merrimack. This, in this Times Weekly article of February 28, 1863, is quoted, Quartermaster Swayze was watching her with a glass from the fort when she went down and some boys in the tower of the lighthouse had still a better view. This was probably Alex, who was 17 by that time, and James, who was 14. They say that she rose on the sea. Okay, that didn't sound right. <laughs> they say that when she, ro when she rose on the sea, she stood on her bow for an instant. And when the roller combed over her port bow, she disappeared. No one knew how many people or who were on the boat, but they did 
put the pieces together and they know that at least nine, uh, that all were lost, there were no survivors. There's two gravestones, uh, this one at Hermerta Grove for Captain Hiram Hatch of the Merrimack. And if you can see that's in pretty rough shape, and I think as we speak it's being repaired. And then the other for Charles McLean, who was a partner with um, Carson at one time, I'm told. Anyway, this was one of the stones that had been uncovered. It had been covered with sod and we uncovered it. And you can see how much cleaner it is. It was not affected by the mold that causes that darkness on them. Well, there's other stone there. So that same year, at the end of it, uh, Sarah retires after six years of service. So she was there from October to 1857, from December to December 1863. And as a woman, her salary was less than that of her husband for the same job. Six years, the longest of any lighthouse keeper at that station. Of the keepers who followed her over the years, 19 resigned, 8 transferred, 7 fired, 3 died, and 1 deserted. <laughs> the Humboldt Harbor Lighthouse suffered severe weather, shifting sands, and even earthquakes. Six years after she retired, there's a next notice of, in the Humble Times. Died in Eureka, October 19th, of paralysis. I guess that's a stroke. Uh, so Mrs. Sarah E. Johnson, a native of Belfast, Ireland, aged 43 years. Actually, when we calculated, she's more like 46, but that's irrelevant. This is her stone that has now been raised and looking quite spitty. Sarah's probate, 1871. Joshua Van Sant, petitioner. The deceased left no real estate and but little personal estate, the whole of which was exhausted toward the payment of the expenses of her last sickness and funeral. But Sarah had another legacy. She left six children, William, Eliza, Alexander, James, Thomas, and Sarah, and among them 24 grandchildren. Some, many, several of her children married into Humboldt families, and you might recognize some of these surnames that have become part of Humboldt's. Hampton, mm -hmm. Wing, Glatt, mm -hmm. Adeline, Gall, Messerly, Haley, Kennedy, Risbull, Ball, Gilmore, and I'm proud to say Vincent, and finally uh, related to Vincent. connected to uh, Messerly's is the Schuster name. Some of you recognize Schuster's name. Um, the, that, anyway, last spring, I happened to uh, see a Facebook page from a Melvin Schuster over about the Reading area. He had a box of uh, Messerly family um, archives, photographs and stuff. And I'm like, oh, can we get a picture of Sarah? So I sent an email and asked if he um, might have something about a Sarah Johnson, who would have been the, uh, related to that family. And he wrote back and said, yeah, he had a picture. On the back was written, Sarah Johnson, in pencil. And I was breathless. And it didn't take him very long to send it, given today's communications. Um, I was breathless, I was ecstatic. I sat there and I looked at this and I looked at this. And this is really a special photograph. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, she looks very good for having six kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Problem being, the more I looked at it, I, I read on the same thing because when our Sarah became Sarah Johnson, she had already had five children. Yeah. And so I think this has to be her daughter, Sarah Johnson. So. <laughs> but her mother might have looked something like that. <laughs> That's all right. I was really glad to have it. Is there a photographer on the back of the picture? Not that I know of, but I know Van Sant was the, a photographer in town, and I'd like to see that. I haven't found that. Good question. So this was courtesy of Melvin Schuster, who was the son of Merle, the one we know as the um, photographer, the aerial photographer from so much humble history. You know, her hair is down, but she just she's not married. Oh really? Oh, that's I know that that might be okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I have a bit more information on her in a bit here, but I'm going to run through each of her children and get a little bit of their um, bio so see what else the contribution for me to the Humboldt County. Okay, William. <coughs> he, in 1870, was at Martin's Field, Martin's Ferry, as a grocery clerk. In 1872, he married Mary Camden. He served in the National Guard. And the first of their four children were born in 1872 as well. He built the Har Star Hotel in Springfield, or in Fortuna as we know it now, which he leased out out. He never um, used it. This is the, the hotel that burned a couple years ago. In 1872, he went into partnership in mercantile venture with and it was Harps and McKenna. In 1876, he was elected, elected the county clerk. In 1880, census, William Sr. was living with William Jr. and his family in Eureka. In 1884, he had moved to Washington State, where he was a postal clerk for the next 30 years. The son, Alexander, by 1863, which is the year Sarah retired, he was living in Canyon City, Oregon. And I don't know if you know that country, but it's dry, not like Humboldt County. <laughs> <laughs> he married twice. Uh, he had two ten children, nine of whom grew to adulthood. He worked in mining and ran a hotel in Canyon City and ran a sawmill on Pine Creek before engaging in farming. And in 1899, bought a livery stable in Canyon City. In 1900, he was working as a teamster. <coughs> the photo is courtesy of a descendant of his, Joan Rutty, with whom I've done some corresponding throughout this period. Okay, James, Captain James. He was a mariner, a launch operator, a steamboat captain. In his obituary, again on the Susie Baker Fountain pa papers, Captain McKenna was probably one of the best known men on Humboldt Bay, having been connected with its water traffic ever since his boyhood days. As a raftsman, steamboat master, and lately for the past 15 years or more in the boat hiring and launch business at the foot of H Street, <laughs> he was 59 years old. And he's buried next in Myrtle Grove next to his mother. <coughs> And on the, uh, on the same page in the Susie Baker papers, there's this clipping that uh, gives you a little flavor of maybe what uh, James was about. 1874, Temperance Saloon. James McKenna has converted his whiskey saloon on First Street between F and G into a strictly temperance saloon, where he will henceforth vend only temperance beverages. <laughs> he will also keep cigars, tobacco, and pipes for sale, and he retains his billiard table. We call attention to his advertisement in our columns this morning. Give him a call. He's <laughs> <laughs> no longer in business. I don't know how to do that. And this is a, the site of his uh, stone, which has now been raised beside his mother's. And we would hope, for, again, as I said, we had hoped that there something written on the other side here. It wasn't. Uh, son Thomas never married. 
He was a clerk at Ronerville, and he was a donkey engineer at Sosha. In 1930, he was a resident and an employee of engineer at the Labor Hospital on H. and Harris in Eureka. He died of injuries months after a boiler explosion, and he was buried in Myrtle Grove. Uh, the recorded location is near his mother's, but there is no marker. Now, some of you remember the General Hospital. Actually, my youngest son was born there. Okay, moving right along. Uh, daughter Sarah. <coughs> this is the Sarah who was born at the lighthouse. After her mother died, Sarah, who was 12 at the time, lived with her sister Eliza Van Sant. She was married in 1880 at the age of 22 to a Charles Moses. He was a tinsmith. And they moved to Pasadena, California. The 1900 census has her listed as mother of two, but with zero children living. I hope she had some more children after that, but we don't know. Okay, next, I want to, uh, as we um, come to the, near to the end of this program, I'd like to present just a short series of photos of the lighthouse as it was deteriorating. This one is from 1892. This was the year that the one at Table Bluff went into service. And it's still pretty good shape. This is 1912. Looks like it's being shored up with some little help. 1920, the roof is off and a lot of debris there on the ground. And 1927, the roof is, the rafters are gone and some of the walls are gone. And this is the current condition of the site. And you can see the Coast Guard headquarters just beyond the street, trees there. I'm going to take us back to the 1920 period for a minute because that year there was a 1920 tribute to a crumbling tower written by a Frederick C. Schindler. It was a big article, worth re a read, but I'm just going to read a paragraph here because it's such a fitting note to close on. He described the tri uh, trip that he took up there to visit it. <coughs> up to the peak. Another turn, and we were in a small round room, directly beneath the lamp room. In the iron ceiling of this room is a small hole reached by an iron ladder, the entrance to the light. Here, in this tower room, we could picture the first keeper pausing on his way to light the lamp on the evening of the 20th of December, 1856, when for the first time the steady white light threw its signal to seaward. And we could picture one of the later keepers, Mrs. Captain Johnson, mother, grandmother of Joshua Van Sant, <coughs> pausing here in her hourly climbs to trim the old oil lamp. Oh. And we remember that her husband, Captain Johnson, had died here, and that she had gone on with his work where he left off. We wondered if she, standing out there on the storm-swept platform of a night, taking the place of her departed partner, could not feel his presence and derive a comfort therefrom that would have been lost to her had she left the light to be trimmed by the stranger's hand. Um, if somebody in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, folks. Thank mm -hmm. you.